So I want to give a couple big thank yous for the success of today's pregame show. It, there's a, I'd like to give credit to two people, Maggie Bayless of Zing Train fame for her celebrity Zoom capabilities and the U of M Law School graduate, Kathy Wyatt, who's chief analyst and assistant to Sheriff Clayton. I certainly would not have been able to get this organized without both of you. And thank you, Kathy. Fabulous. Excuse my, my garb. I was trying to squeeze in my workout before our meeting, so. <laughs> well, good, excellent. Keep that athletic prowess that you I'm had trying. from. It's the, only, it's the only way to manage stress, right? It's the, <laughs> well, it's one the, excellent way to manage stress. It sure is. So, I, so I'm, go ahead and, and do an informal beginning. Our focus today is on youth, kids. I love kids. Kids make us laugh. They keep us young. They delight us. And yet sometimes they deeply disappoint us. Um, I, I would like to introduce uh, Sheriff Clayton. Uh, he has served as criminal justice professional for 33 years. He's currently serving his fourth term and leads a values and mission driven organization. There's no doubt that Sheriff Clayton has our community well being at heart. He has specialized in several areas subject control, use of force, cultural diversity, bias free policing organizational management and leadership. Sheriff Jerry Clayton has also served on a number of governor appointed advisory councils, task force and commissions, including serving as commissioner for the Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards, recently serving as chairperson. I, I learned also that he has um, been a consult for the FBI. That was something very new to me. Plus, listen to this. Sheriff Clayton serves on no, numerous local boards. These include the Washington area, area Council for Children, the local chapter of the National Alliance of, on Mental Illness, the Mental Health Treatment Court Advisory Board, and the Care Board working to end homelessness. Rather than ramble on and on, I want each of you to go to the county website and see all of the great educational, the engagement programs and youth programs that our sheriff has fostered. One last note, Sheriff Jerry Clayton has also received international recognition for his work in the criminal justice field. He was invited as a representative of law enforcement to attend uh, an international community policing conference in Barcelona. In 2017, at the invitation of the UN High Commission on Human Rights, Sheriff Clayton was representative from the US. Also, he presented at the international conference on law enforcement and bias-based policing in Geneva, Switzerland. So I could go on and on with many more accolades, but let's get started. Um, I mentioned youth and kids. I love kids. I taught at Ypsilanti High School and back when it was YHS. And I know Sheriff Clayton that you have paths that intersect. So with considering those paths that you or your officers intersect with young people, what are some aspects of your job which are challenges with regard to youth? And what are some aspects which are joyous such as your new driver's ed program. Uh, yeah, so first off, good morning. I, I am really honored to, to, to participate. The one thing you didn't hear Jane talk about was um, a lot of work specific. I mean, we do a lot of work with young folks. Um, that is not my expertise, so I'm gonna make sure that I am I am clear. I see a, a lot of friends on here, people like Belinda, who do a lot of work with youth that could probably speak more intelligently about a lot of different things than I can. But I'll just speak to what I know, and 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 I'll and I'll say this too, um, especially as it relates to to boards and and things of that nature. I participate, but our real expert in a lot of that work is Kathy Wyatt, quite frankly. Um, and when we talk about the the driver's ed, I'll say this. Um, my main contribution to the driver's education initiative that's moving forward now was to to really was to bless it. 
It, it really was Kathy's brainchild, and it really stems from this. Uh, I'll, I'll, I will go back into my youth, right? Um, when, and I think a lot of us were in the same same spot. When, when it was time for me to get my license, we had free driver's education at my high school. And it didn't cost my parents any money to 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 get me uh to give me in driver's ed and get me give me a license and the fact that it costs now i think is 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 very disappointing so when kathy talked about this um this collaboration that would make driver's education available to a number of our young folks uh it was easy for me to say yeah let's move forward and uh, she did all the groundwork but the essence of it is essentially this um although we have moved to you know, as a as a as a culture, uh, ride share and uh, you know, especially in this county, bicycles and things of that nature. You know, having that license and being able to drive and to do so in a responsible way, that mobility, as we all know, opens up so many doors. And when you think about a lot of our youth, especially those individuals that we know, uh, are 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 challenged in terms of maybe having contact with the criminal legal system, we find that they are isolated. They're isolated. Oftentimes, they don't get off their block. They don't have access to the certain the, the the required services. So I know at some point we're going to talk about the mental health challenges and all those things that our young folks face. You know, one of the keys to that is to to make resources available. And oftentimes, if they're in a single parent household, or if they're in a, in a dual family household, but both families are working just to keep a roof over their head, it's up to the kids to make sure that they can move from place to place. And we want to make sure that as they're driving, they do so in the most responsible way, that they have a license, because uh, you know what, what's going to happen. Our young folks are going to do, just like many of us, what they need to do to survive or meet their needs. So if they don't have access to learning how to drive and, and a valid driver's license, they're going to drive anyway if they have access to a vehicle. And all that does is increases the, the likelihood of them coming in contact with, our, with, with, with our, our folks. And although I think our folks and the other criminal justice agencies in our county uh, do a pretty good job of exercising discretion, we don't want kids in the system and we don't want, want them harmed, uh, there are still sometimes requirements for them to take action. So long story short, this is just another is initiative that we believe are some of the front end interventions that are so yeah. critical to positioning our young folks to be successful in life. And, um, you know, we could talk about a number of things. I hope at some point we talk about the proposed youth assessment center, because I think as you think about your work uh, in this youth space, and I think your group is, is going to be really, really important in terms of how we move forward. Um, your understanding of this youth assessment center was being proposed and what the what the impact of that youth assessment center is going to be so important. So uh, I don't know if I answered your question uh, at all, but uh, that's the best I got, at least for in, in this for right now. Uh, so let me just say this real quick before, Jane, before you ask questions. Kathy, what did I miss? I know I missed something. What did I miss that really uh, reinforces the essence of the driver's ed program? I think you got it. Okay. I think you got it. So that means she coached me very well. <laughs> So, Kathy, you spend a lot of time over there. What are you actually doing at Ipsland um, Community School? To are you facilitating the entire program and signing people up, or are they already signed up? So, um, it is a partnership with All Star Driving School because they have the expertise. They uh, reduce their fees somewhere 25, 30 percent for us. Um, AAA Foundation uh, gave us an award to basically cover that all-star cost. Um, Ipsy Community Schools is selecting the students and providing the location. Um, I do spend a fair amount of time over there now uh, while the classes are on because I always want to make sure that the room that that's provided was, is open. So as student, soon as the students get out of class, there is an adult there. And I always make sure that I stay after because there are one or two students that um, have, have to wait for parents. And I'm not about to have a student by themselves, or certainly not out in the cold. Um, and it, it's certainly it, the fact that I, there is are those challenges around transportation illustrate why 
um, transportation and having a valid driver's ed, ed, uh, ed, ed license is so important. Um, it is hard. Uh, Washtenaw County is a big county. The east side um, is a big county and, and the buses just don't run on kids' schedules. They run on bus schedules. And so, <laughs> Correct. Uh, yeah, I, I am spending a lot of time and I find the conversations that I have with some of these young people interesting and rewarding. Wow, thank you for that. And thank you for your time over there helping those kids. That's just fabulous. It sounds like a really dynamite program. I'm glad to hear about it. And the fact that it's free to these kids is amazing. It's just great that you were able to get those fees waived from All Star and thanks to AAA Foundation. So we are focusing on, on what's free and what's not free. There are certainly a lot of fines and fees for which are assessed for justice involved young people. We may not have all of these in Washtenaw County, but across the United States, courts and police jurisdictions levy fines and fees. They cover almost every part of the criminal justice process. They can include bench warrants, court appointed attorney fees, court cost fees, filing fees, bondsman fees, DNA database fees, jury fees, crime lab analysis fees, late fees, installment fees, and various other charges. So to what extent do you, Sheriff Clayton, believe that these fees are on impacted kids, justice impacted kids are good or necessary or valuable or not in Washtenaw County? It's a good question. I think so. Obviously, our focus is on youth, but what I'm going to say, and I'll just speak to to right now, what is currently the reality in Washington County. But my my commentary after the fact will will be about all justice related fees. So right now, um, most of the fees are waived in court here in Washington County. Uh, our courts do a, a pretty good job of that. Um, but it had there's a process, right? So they're waived if there's a request. Um, uh, and, and you know the court has a process for that. I don't know all the details, but uh, the requests are usually made by probation or by the defense attorney for for the young 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 person, and uh, and then the waivers are considered. You know, a waiver for fees are considered based on need, right? So uh, we already know that there's disproportionality uh, in the system overall as it, re it relates to to race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic conditions. So there's a factor in there for waiving it based on um, the ability to pay. Uh, really the only fee that's not waived is the, the, the crime victim's rights fee. So, you know, there is a balance in the system, right? Um, that if you do harm to someone, we also, we, we don't wanna, uh, cause we know oftentimes people that are perpetrators were victims first. So, you know, if we can position somebody to, to, to redirect their eyes by not heaping additional financial burden, that's a positive thing. But also that person that was on the receiving end of whatever action that made them a victim or a survivor of a crime, we must make sure that they are they are they are made whole or as well, or there's not additional harm. Uh, restitution, you know, we'll think, talk a little bit about restitution if, if you're okay with that. Uh, not waivable. Um, it's required, you know, as part of the whole uh, Crime Victims' Rights Act. Uh, but Washtenaw County has a, a program, a Rory program, uh, a restoration, so repayment opportunity for restoration for youth. Uh, so it's really a program that's aimed to help uh, juveniles pay down the cost of mandatory restitution. Because think about this, especially for our young folks, it's not the young person that's paying, right? It's the parents of that of 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 those individuals it's that household i'll say it that way and oftentimes those households are i mean they're check to check oftentimes they're right on the borderline that you know one additional fee could spin that whole family out of control right maybe they can't make their mortgage or their rent maybe they can't buy their girl so all of those things we just have to be mindful i'm all about accountability right all about accountability but i think from a societal perspective we have uh, made accountability synonymous with uh punishment and we're in this thing where everybody has to be punished for every trans trans transgression and i think we can hold people accountable uh without this whole sense of punishing uh and in my mind punishment means hurting them so uh, me hurting you for something that you did wrong 
is not helping us from a societal standpoint. I'm gonna hold you accountable. You may have to um, uh, do some form of restorative <clears throat> justice if the victim's family is 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 open to that. But me punishing you by heaping more harm on you is not making us better. So so I I think in Washington County there's a little bit of that mentality there with the restitution program with the waiving the fees upon request. I think we're on the right path. We're not all the way there, but we're on the right path. And and here's why not just in Washington County. But I think overall, the system is flawed in this way. If you pull the budgets from a municipal government or a county government, or and you pull the, the court's budget, and this is not a dig at any of the officials, this is just our reality. This is the way we have built this from a societal standpoint. And you look at their budget, they have their expenditure line items and they have their revenue line items. Invariably, you will see in their revenue line items cost for court cost and fees and fines and all of those things so they're building their budget on the backs of the people that end up in the system i think that's flawed there's a built-in incentive in the system for people to enter the system and for us to put fines and fees on them because the courts have to balance their budget so again this is not a dig at any official this is our reality and i'll just give you uh, one example, um, I work right now with uh, as, a, as a consultant with the Justice Department uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, Missouri. So we under, remember what happened in Ferguson with Ferguson PD and the Ferguson court system. And what was uncovered in Ferguson was their entire court system, their architecture was built on fines and fees of the people that are involved. That is a flawed system. We have built in an incentive for fines and fees. So that may be more than what you asked, but I think that is central to our discussion right now, that for us to move away from the additional fines on our young folks and their families, we must find a way to fund the system without depending on a significant line item being court fees and fines. Exactly. I agree. And I love that you brought us to that. It is a, there are flaws in our system and revenue is certainly a big huge consideration. Um, and I don't, I certainly know we're not going to have, we're not all going to sit here with answers to all of that, but <laughs> um, I, I do want to introduce the, I, the organization which brought me here today. Um, our League of Women Voters have approved a partnership with the Michigan Center for Youth Justice based in Ann Arbor. And they are trying to find ways to help uh, and, and create uh, racially equitable and community-based solutions to reduce uh, at least confinement for justice involved children, youth, young adults. And we're beginning to learn about the removal or reduction of these fees, not just for those who request them, but perhaps to move toward a Michigan campaign, given the fact that we're one county out of 83 in Michigan, this is perhaps not, we're, there are many counties not even on the path to um, helping kids or helping these families. And so the Michigan Center for Youth Justice is trying to pr propose a debt-free justice under HR 4987, and there are three or four bills, 4991 is the last one, but Michigan Center for Youth Justice has called upon Gretchen Whitmer and the Michigan Supreme Court to end the harmful effects of assessing and collecting fines and fees. So um, is, is there any assistance in the trickle down of some of the American Rescue Plan, and I know these millions of dollars that are coming are spread over many, many, many budgets, but is any of this helping Washington County? And it might only be a drop in the bucket, but is there some trickle of funding from that ARP to Washington County and to the Sheriff's Office in particular? Good question. Um, so I can't sp speak specifically to you know, because that's it comes into the board. So you know how this happened, right? The ARPA money has come into the, the different jurisdictions. So uh, individual townships and cities and counties have received those funds based on their application to receive 
those funds. Um, the different local units of government have different processes for uh, making determinations of how to spend those dollars. I know our board of commissioners um, have engaged in a number of different public conversations about those dollars. Um, I know that their uh, focus has been on um, you know, trying to filter everything to an equity lens and really trying to be thoughtful around how those dollars are spent. Uh, and I, I will give them a lot of credit in this sense, too, is that their focus is all, is, has also been on a lot of front end interventions, the things that we're talking about. How do we invest on the front end to better position people so they don't end up in the system? I'll just say this, you know, the commentary for us is if you end up in the system from a societal standpoint, we have failed. Now, we don't mean we don't need to give up, but we have failed if you've entered the system, if we could have done something on the front end. So I know that has been a lot of the driver with some of the ARPA funds. From a sheriff's office perspective, um, I don't believe we're on the agenda to receive a lot of those funds. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I haven't pushed it all that much. Um, and, and, I'll, and here's why. We were so fortunate back in 18 uh, when the public safety mental health millage passed. That was significant stabilizing uh, um, uh, revenue stream. Now, every organization could use more money, but I think the money from ARPA would be better used elsewhere other than coming to us because we're not struggling right now from a financial standpoint. Um, I will just say this as uh, something for us to be mindful of. Uh, as we think about how we use those dollars, uh, we need to be careful because those aren't structural dollars. So my fear around when people are talking about we're going to use ARPA money, which I think is good money to use, is if we build an architecture to address certain things and it's three or four years of money and then that money goes away, how do we structurally support those initiatives down the line? Think about that. If we build something and we're addressing people's needs and we start to be dependent on that from a community standpoint, and then the ARPA money goes away and that those structural dollars go away, we sort of end up right back where we are. So if we can think about using the ARPA money, whether it's in the juvenile space or in other spaces, with a plan towards securing structural dollars to continue it moving forward, I think we'd be better off. The only other thing I'll say around the, the statewide initiative is, you know, the governor had her had the task force for jail uh, and criminal justice reform that forwarded so many recommendations. Now she has a jail advisory council. I'll be honest with you, I don't know if there's anything focused on youth, but as the jail advisory council moves forward, I think that's the next next big, big agenda. And in this space, with a uh, uh, if if we're bipartisan about anything. It is around some of some of these criminal justice reforms, and if we can get that focused on youth, we can have some of the same impact on youth as we've had on the adult system. So, excellent, excellent. You you precipitated the question I had about that temporary funding. That's great, <laughs> fabulous. But another thing you said, which is really super important, and at the and I think really where I'd like to go with this is. What can we do on the front end? What can we do to preempt any kid getting involved in the justice system? And um, perhaps we should jump over for at least a moment or two to talk about last Thursday and your law enforcement assisted diversion because LEAD, um, and I know you added another D, L-E-A-D-D, -D, but talk about that for just a moment because that again starts at the crux of the problem and starts to meet and preempt a justice involved kid getting in the system. Great. So yeah, lead. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. We had to add a D to it because you know Washington County, so we had to put one more in it. But <laughs> but but the D really is about diversion and deflection, right? So think about this: the diversion piece is you you're entered you've entered the system. And now we're looking at each point of contact, even if we think about it even from a sequential intercept standpoint, whether it's with the police, the courts, the jail, you know, are there opportunities to divert that person from uh, the system into treatment or support? The deflection piece is really, I think, the, the most important part. How about deflecting that person before they even get in the system? And, and you know, it really is a formalized approach to what our staff, a lot of our staff already do. They really do. They do exercise really good discretion. There are a number of times, and the, the essence of lead is simply this. Police officer comes in contact with someone, it's, and you know, they're usually 
patrolling or in the same place over and over again. They know these individuals. Uh, maybe the person's engaged in low level or alleged low level criminal activity. Uh, nothing assaultive, nothing harmful. And they know this person has a behavioral health disorder, some kind of substance use disorder, some kind of mental health disorder. Um, there, we have some criteria established. They go through a quick uh, assessment. Uh, and then they can say, I think this person is appropriate for diversion or deflection. Then they make a call and then a clinical uh, social worker case manager comes out and meets that deputy and does their own assessment. And then the person is given a choice. So say they're engaged in some kind of criminal activity. The police report still will be written. It still may even be submitted to the prosecutor. So the prosecutor's office is another partner. The prosecutor has a lead prosecutor and we just sit on that report. And that person goes and now they start to address their issues. Again, maybe it's mental health, substance use disorder. We also know what's combined with that, right? Housing insecurity, food insecurity, all the things that we know uh, are barriers to people being in a good place. And if we can work with someone to address those issues and never have to move forward on that case, we start to impact the system, we start to impact people. And at the end of the day, you know, we've added a little bit to our our mission statement. Our mission statement used to start off uh, create public safety. Now our mission statement is morphed into co-produce public safety and well-being. And it's predicated on the understanding of us that we have a role in working with our community to produce public safety, but you can't be safe if the community doesn't feel well, right? If, if people aren't held in a, in a harmless way. And, and so our staff, um, has that ability now to divert people, deflect people outside of the system. We've always had a really good working relationship with CMH. It's a strong partnership. So this was just a natural evolution of that. Us, community mental health, and the public defender started off the partnership, went to Seattle, learned some stuff, and then the prosecutor's office is brought on board. So I'm really excited about this initiative because I think this becomes a game changer for us. Absolutely. That's great. It's just fabulous. Um, so do a lot of, I just want to get down to a couple nitty gritty kinds of things. Let's say a kid already has debt and already um, is behind, maybe didn't show up in court, has a bench warrant. Um, do we have an idea of how much debt um, is sitting there with either people who are adults or kids, um, do we have an idea of the amount of debt that cannot be collected or is in trouble of not being collected? And what happens Jane, a, if it's not collected? <laughs> right, right. Jay, that's a great question. I'll be very honest with you. On the juvenile side, I really don't know. Uh, Kathy, what's his name? Is it Kevin Mitchell? Uh, yes, it, um, Kevin Mitchell is um, the uh, director of the youth center and could answer a lot of those questions. Catherine O'Grady is the yeah. juvenile court administrator. She also would be a really good uh, source for specific information. Yeah, Kathy's a hundred percent right. I would, you know, as your as your group uh, continues to explore, um, she's probably already on your list of of, of guests to talk to. But uh, if not, I would add her. She, she knows more about from the juvenile system. Now, in the adult system, just overall, let me just give you an example. Uh, just overall, um, back a couple of years ago when we transitioned systems, uh, we looked at the debt, just the jail debt, just the jail debt that people owed. Um, I can't remember, 600000 500000 It was a significant amount of money held by a couple of thousand formerly incarcerated individuals and we waived that fee. So we, we, we canceled that fee out. We had the authority to do it within the sheriff's office um, and it was uncollected fee. So, and the reason why we did it is this. So even if you owe, cause the, the, the state allows us to charge a fee for incarcerated individuals. So there's a booking fee when we book you, this again, you're paying for the system, we charge you a certain amount, and then we can charge you per, a per day fee. Uh, and those add up. I mean, they really do add up, right? And we provide uh, what's called commissary, uh, some items 
you know, we, provide, we provide essential items for free. We provide additional items at a cost. And for those that don't have money, uh, we give them a certain amount of money per week to buy some of those items. So again, those costs add up. And as we were entering to a new system, we looked at what the back amount that was owed and we don't aggressively go after people anyway. So I, we are not, we don't send to collection agencies. So if you owe money, we don't send people out. And again, it's just based on the belief you got enough stress on you. If you've gone through, if you've been in jail for 30 days and your family's been stressed and now you're out and you're trying to catch up on bills, you don't need us sending a, a, a debt collector after you. Um, and we don't need that going on your credit record uh, if you're trying to build your credit to again, stabilize your, your home life. So because we knew we weren't gonna collect it and we weren't gonna pursue it, we just waived it. So um, we got the support of the Board of Commissioners uh, and we announced it and we wanted to announce it, not to brag about it, but to announce it to tell those folks that knew they had that debt hanging over their head, that that debt was no longer hanging over their head. So just to give you an idea, you're talking six, seven hundred thousand dollars over a couple or a few thousand people, think, and that's just jail costs. Now you just take that and keep extrapolating that over court fees and everything else. We're probably in the millions of dollars that people owe uh, to the system. That that for us, we we don't send warrants out for you, but if you owe court fees, um, there there's going to be a bench warrant out for you. And again, it keeps that cycle. And think about it from this perspective. Uh, if you didn't have the money to pay the fee, or, and let me just back up even more, you know, people enter the system sometimes for traffic offenses, lights out, things like that, maybe because they didn't have the money to, to pay for it. If I didn't have the money to put the, to fix my tail light, then I probably don't have the money to pay the, the court fee, and it just continues to build on each other. So again, uh, sorry for being so long winded, but you know, it's a, it's, it's a, complicated issue that really doesn't have to be that complicated if we're just thoughtful in terms of how we approach them. I love that answer. I love knowing that they're waived, the fees are waived in many instances. I just think that's excellent. And I certainly didn't know that that happened. It, it's just great. So then debt doesn't simply lead to incarceration. It, you have shortcut that. Not, not right, not necessarily, you know, and again, we're just one component of the system um, that does lead to incarceration when we look at the entire system uh, because of really just the automated nature of how it goes. If you owe the courts money, there's a process for them to to hold you accountable for that, and it ends up in bench warrant. I will give you this. I, I Let me just say this really quickly as just an example of what is possible. So during the pandemic that we're still in, uh, and our and our desire to reduce the, the population in the jail uh, and our desire to reduce the contact between our staff, our road patrol depths and the staff. There are certain things that we didn't do on the road. We work with the courts and the courts waived our. So if the judge issues a bench warrant and a police officer stops someone, they don't have any discretion. That's the judge is ordering us to arrest that person and bring them before them. But in certain low level offenses during the pandemic. The courts work with with not just us, but with other local agencies to to and they identify certain bench warrants that you didn't have to arrest for. So there were a lot of folks, especially those that were financially related that had bench warrants that did not get, that have not been arrested during the pandemic. So it just goes to show it is possible if we decide that's the path that we want to follow. Fascinating. That's just great. And so that's one pretty good outcome from the pandemic. It may be the only good outcome, but it's one good one. That's so cool. Um, someone mentioned to me that a public offender, defender is free. And I wonder, just a quick question here, does the public defender, if I had a court appointed attorney and I don't have any ability, I've been raised in poverty, I might be fifth generation of, uh, impoverished in my family. Do I need to pay these costs at some point to um, pay the public defender or to pay for that court appointed defender? No, great question. You do not. Um, the, the, there, there are no, 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 no fees for the public defender. And I, I got to say, in Washington County, we probably have the best public defender and the best public defender's office in the state. 
So Delphia Simpson is I'm Delphia. I'm a big fan of her. Uh, and even before that, Lloyd Powell. Lloyd Powell was a champion of uh, the public defender's office and the support that the public defender's office gets in Washington County is different than in other places. Now, uh, it's still we they still could use more resources, but Washington County has done a pretty good job of resourcing the public defender's office. And again, I think we have the best one to champion. But to answer your question, uh, no, they do not have to pay for those services. And, and I'll just add this last piece. You know, some people will say, well, yeah, you get what you pay for, right? That you don't have to pay for it. So the quality of those services aren't as good or the quality of the people delivering the services. I would argue that is not true in Washington County. Um, Delphia and her staff are top notch attorneys. You know, the challenge for them is workload, right? So they're, they're, they are very talented individuals. They do carry a very vast workload. And that impacts their ability to really, really zone, I think really um, zero in on so, for some of the clients. But I think the services that they get are top notch. Fabulous. Oh my gosh. I agree with you about Delphia Simpson. She's just incredible, incredible. And it was, it was good that she was also on the call last Thursday when you rolled out your lead program. That, were, that was a, a wonderful team you had organized for that. So hats off to you. Um, I'm going to pull Maggie back in if, if we could. Maggie's our, our Zoom person and she's looking at the chat. I know that Sheriff Clayton, you could also see the chat. Um, actually, but uh, actually he, he can't see the chat, James, because oh. I couldn't make him a co-host. I think okay. you have to do that. Okay, well, I'll certainly do that right now. Um, Okay, but could you go ahead while I'm doing that? Um, could you, Maggie, make a, a quick, take a quick look and um, pull out a yeah, question? So, right, so I just want to let the group know there are two ways to ask questions. One, you can use the raise hand function and then um, I'll call on you or you can type your message into the chat. I'm looking for raised hands and I see one. Belinda. Hi, thanks. Um, good to see uh, Sheriff Clayton and Ms. Kathy today. I don't get to see them much in this uh, pandemic. Uh, I wanted to go back to the driver's ed program. I had not heard about it. And um, the DRC is working with the circuit court on a docket for youth who are aging out of the foster care system. We've been doing this since uh, early in the pandemic um, be, for a variety of reasons. I won't go into that, but uh, the court is now, the juvenile court is now uh, giving very intense attention to each of those youth uh, who are about 16, uh, 15, 16 years old, and they're beginning to age out of the foster care system. And driver's ed is a recurring theme um, keeping, I mean, just, just for the, the, the audience here, kids aging out of the foster care system means that they're living in a residential setting or with foster parents. Um, very often, they do not have parental support or family support to get through the driver's education experience. Um, and for everything that Sheriff Clayton mentioned, having that driver's license is really important to their ability to transition into adult life and live independently and work and go to school and all the things that we desire for our young people. So I'm just wondering, is this um, program available to them or how do I learn more about it? We don't have to take a lot of time here, but I just wanted to learn more about it. Oh, and Sheriff, should I take that? Oh yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Kathy, sure. So, um, it's kind of complicated and I would be happy to talk to you more, you know, at length about it, about it and some of the challenges depending upon age, you know, in another setting, if you would like. Um, so one of the, for children aging out of the foster care system, actually driver's education is no longer available because it's kids who are under 18, by the time they pass segment two. 
So for specifically kids driving out of the, um, get me aging out of the uh, foster care system, they, there's a whole nother challenge. And in fact, I just was on a meeting with Michigan Works and Ozone House last week uh, where I connected them, the two of them. Uh, Michigan Works has a program that is covers kids actually um, in that age group up to 24 that um, is part of their employment or secondary education uh, readiness that includes uh, driver's training. Um, the, the challenge they've had in the past is that kids, uh, there's, you know, it's federal money, they're required to hit all of, you know, be a part of that overall program. And uh, kids would show up to get driver's ed, that's all, and then they wouldn't, that, that was it. You know, they wouldn't stay for the whole program. Um, but Ozone and um, the uh, Michigan Works are going to be talking about how they can get kids who need a lot of these services. Because it's often the kids who need driver's ed have, um, are, are from under-resourced families and have, could use a lot of these other services. So uh, they're connected. I've also connected them. There is a new uh, driving school in um, Washington County that is located right on Michigan Avenue in uh, that, I think it's the, the Key Bank building that right downtown on Michigan in um, Ham. And uh, they, so I connected them, uh, you know, also to him, to this Coach Richardson's driving school. So because of, of the location, that is the other challenge that a lot of young people face in getting driver's education is they, they don't have access to transportation and they have, uh, you know, getting there or, or um, so I, right now, it sounds like uh, kids aging out of foster care wouldn't fit into the driver's ed program that is at the school. But I think if we were to talk about it, maybe we could come up with an alternative, um, a, a possibility if you're interested, since I ended up doing a lot of work in this area. Okay, uh, I'll just add it to my to-do list and reach out to you separately okay. on it so you can maybe learn more about it. And I do have to hop off uh, to get to a 10 o'clock, but thanks everybody for this session. Good to see you, Belinda. You too. Yeah, fabulous. Um, just as a last question, is the YCS driver's ed program a pilot or will it only be available to Ipsy kids? How does, how does that work? It is currently a pilot. It is brand new. We're working through a lot of challenges. Um, I would be happy to and remiss to not to mention that we will need funding for it in the future. Um, <laughs> just have to throw that out there. Uh, it, and it is a partnership uh, right now with YCS. And we have another class starting up in March. Um, uh, there is a maximum set by the state for the number of students that can be in any one specific class. So we'll have another one in March. And uh, as soon as that's done, uh, we'll start fundraising for next year. Thank you. I'll just add a lot of these are the you know, pilots, we evaluate the pilots very similar to lead lead is a pilot for mm -hmm. us that will evaluate with the intent of making it a countywide initiative. So as you all know, doing the pilot at this small scale, and then being able to replicate that throughout the county is, is has been we found to be a pretty good approach. So hopefully we'll be able to do the same with the driving program. I'm not okay. seeing any hands, and no one has chatted me a question, but they might have chatted directly to you, Sheriff Clayton, or to Jane. So 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 nobody's chatted me a question, but if 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 I can, um, and and, and if you're interested, I can talk a little bit about the this this whole Washington our County Youth Assessment um center which i think is really really <clears throat> important and, and your 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 team um i think will be important voices moving forward because i think this is in your wheelhouse so uh i'm just going to take from the narrative uh that's been sort of laid out so uh the way we're looking at this is washington county youth assessment center 
Uh, and and we, we understand that this is not a new concept, right? There are assessment centers all over the country that's really focused uh, on diverting uh, our young folks or preventing our young folks from entering uh, our child welfare, our justice system, or deeply penetrating that system. And as we're, how, how it's being thought about in Washington County is really serving as this single point of contact that will help, you know, from an assessment standpoint, identify some of uh, what are the underlying contributing issues uh, for some of the behaviors that we see with some of our young folks, right? Uh, some of them and their families, and really also to position uh, the community to provide them some individualized services and resources. And, and that can happen in a number of different ways, right? So with the right kind of partnerships, you can have interventions in schools, you could have interventions when folks come in contact with some of our, our criminal justice uh, actors. Uh, sometimes it's proactive because the parents may ask for the interactions. Uh, and, and through partnerships with various community stakeholders that we know interact with youth, their points of contact. If we had um, the uh, system in place, this we could provide some of that, those assessments. So the assessments sort of give you some an idea of what's going on and they do the assessment uh, through in-depth uh, interviews, uh, utilizing validated screening assessment tools, um, and, and we're really just trying to understand what are the barriers, what are the challenges uh, at home, at school, in other areas. So following the assessment, uh, then they are written what, what I would call a prescription, right, for, for individualized resources. Here's what they need, here's how they need, and we also know this, right, No, none of us there's not, there's very rarely is there a single prescription that addresses all of our concerns, right? That there are multiple things that we need to help us be uh, well. And, and, and the approach is how do we combine all that together to make sure that we position that young folk, that young person to move forward successfully. Um, and I'll just take this as at the core of this, this approach is, you know, a collaborative effort, right? Community-based collaborative effort that's really designed to cut through a lot of the red tape that exists now uh, that we know frustrate families uh, when they're trying to access services. Uh, and a couple things really quick. So assessment centers encompass three core components that we think are important. Single point of contact, screening and assessment, and then the other piece is effective case management where they draw together all those resources. That person has one single case manager that helps them and their family navigate their, their resources. And I just want to really, really quick, some of the impacts that we've seen around the country, uh, and I want to take this exactly from the narrative here. It says, for example, recidivism rates among youth served in places like uh, Miami-Dade uh, and Clark County went down to 5 and 7%. Uh, and at a, a, a youth center that was uh, set up in Louisiana saw a 42% reduction in court petitions and a 22% increase in diversions since it opened in, in 2014. So, you know, there's an evidence-based approach here that we think could yield tangible out, uh, results in Washtenaw County. Um, <clears throat> specific to Washtenaw County, you know, we've done the adult sequential, sequential intercept. They've done a similar approach in Washington, County, and they've identified a couple of things, you know, especially post pandemic, right? 2019, it says one in three of our high school students and half of our female students reported persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness um, and an overall increase of that population since 2009. And um, since the pandemic, uh, this is roughly 70% of youth involved in the system have a mental health disorder, 46% have a substance use disorder, and 90% have experienced traumatic victimization. So we know those kids in the system have been impacted tremendously, and this is, you know, really the focus is how do we, on the front end, address some of their needs. The goal of the work uh, is to create a comprehensive blueprint for identification of youth. So we did this. Um, sequential intercept at the youth level to identify where are the gaps, where are the overlaps. Now, how do we develop a blueprint for addressing those? And I I'll, I'll, I'll want to just really quick give, give you this. Uh, so the work that this group did, which are a lot of the community partners in Washington County, uh, the group identified four priority areas. Supportive housing expansion, right? So we know 
housing insecurity is not just a challenge for our adult population, but it's for our, our youth, right? We know a lot of our youth are couch surfing, going from place to place. Uh, another priority area is a 24 seven drop off facility. So, you know, we have a 24 seven drop off facility uh, for our adult system. Now we want to want to develop one for our juvenile system, develop a community based peer to peer system for supporting vulnerable youth and families. And the fourth is develop uh, a first contact youth assistant program, right? So right up top, almost like a youth base. I don't know if you would call it lead, but some kind of first contact uh, 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 approach. Um, we've a lot of this work has already been was done based on the, the money that we got from the millage. So the millage, that public safety millage, mental health millage, is at the root of so much work that's being done in the adult and the youth system uh, that I don't think we have done a good enough job of identifying a lot of that. Uh, I'll end there, but I just wanted to um, speak to that and, and add one more piece. We also know, just like in the adult system, uh, in the youth system, that there's disproportionality between our white youth and our, and our, and our young youth of color. And the example is in 2017, 69% of the justice involved youth were youth of color while only representing 25% of the total population of, of youth in our community based on the census. So, you know, all the programs that we think about both in the adult system and in the um, juvenile system is it, for everyone. And I, I wanna be really, really mindful of speaking to that. The system's for everyone, but we have to be honest and understand the disproportionality of the systems and the impact, the disparate impact it's had to this point. And, and in Washington County, I think our values are not just uh, that everybody is treated equally, but as a community, we actually achieve equity, which means in our historically underserved populations and our historically underserved areas, we have to pour in more resources, not the same amount, Although people might be better, that disproportionality will still exist. So it is not anti any other group. It is a pro recognition of the disparities in the past and, and our commitment to achieving equity means we have to focus additional resources in areas that have, have historically uh, suffered from disparate treatment. Uh, I will get off my soapbox right now. I see some hands that are raised uh, and I'll turn it back to Maggie. Thanks. Um... Harvey has had his hand up for a bit. Harvey, did you have a question still? So I'm interested in this package of five bills, House Bills 4987 and 91, because I'm a big supporter of Michigan Center for Youth Justice. Have you had a chance to assess how these bills will affect the Sheriff's Department? And just out of curiosity, have any of our Washtenaw-based state legislators come to you and asked you that question? Unfortunately, my answer to both of those is no. I've not had a chance to really delve into those more, mostly because I've been dealing on the jail advisory council a lot of the work around the the, the adult system. Um, but I will do so, and uh, I am always you know I get a good relationship with our state legislation, and if they come to me, uh, <laughs> I will engage with them. But in all honesty, the answer to both of those are no. Unfortunately, they should be coming to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Joan, you've got a question. Thank you. Uh, so many interesting and important things in the Youth Assessment Center. I, uh, could you tell us how you have set up and what sort of data process? Uh, 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 we need data on it, right? So we can uh, see if we're going to be as good as some of the counties you mentioned that have done so well. How are, how are we um, accumulating and how are you getting the data and what sort of data is it? So, so, so again, Joan, I'll, I'll just say this. So that the, the youth space is not my space. Uh, I, I don't, I don't lead in that. Uh, I, we just happy to be a, a contributor. I think, um, again, I would say if you brought in someone like uh, 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 Catherine O'Grady or Trish Cortez, actually, or, or both of them together, they could speak a lot more intelligently about this than I can. Um, but I'll say this, I am confident they've replicated what we tried to do in the adult system. 
And really what it requires is the integration of a lot of data. So in the adult system, we had to integrate jail data and mental health data. My assumption is in the youth system, they had to integrate their juvenile data with their mental health data to build those, those data sets to start to guide their work. But in all honesty, I can't speak specifically to it because I was not a part of that process. Thank you. Kathy, I see you have your hand up. I'm guessing you, it might not be a question. It might be an answer. Um, actually, I did. And uh, the reason is I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Valencia Brooks um, from Ipsy Community High School, who runs the Grizzly Center, which is the restorative justice center at the high school, and to the young people that she's put together um, to help uh, with that. Uh, they're Grizzly mentors, and they're amazing young people. Um, and it, it is, for, the, uh, for those of you who don't know it, uh, the Grizzly Center uses restorative practices to uh, resolve conflict within the school, between kids, between teachers, uh, proactively deal with the issues using restorative practices. And it struck me um, being in the school more, I've talked to some of the kids and actually a couple of the mentors and um, they, the difference restorative practice and having that center in the school from what they're telling me is they just, it, it, it's a vital part of the school. And uh, one of the things uh, Sheriff Clayton may, can maybe talk about in terms of the adult system is uh, the support that he has and the sheriff's office has for restorative, uh, restorative justice. But I did want to give a shout out to them and, and the work they're doing and, and that, that reminder. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think Kathy gave the shout out now just so very similar to the driver's license initiative, uh, Kathy was uh, on the ground involved in one, you know, you know, the sheriff's office was one of the founding partners, but Kathy was the founding leader of the development of the Grizzly Center. So again, another one of those initiatives that she has thrown herself completely in and the outcome has been positive results for, for us as a community. So I uh, want to make sure we acknowledge that. So I know we're getting right to the end, but there is a lot of enthusiasm for the Youth Assessment Center. Just what can people on this call do to, to support it? I think the first thing um, I was, as, as I thought about this, you know, I was talking to Kathy, I said, well, I'll come on and talk about it, but I know the youth is not my space uh, from an expertise standpoint, we know enough about it. But as I thought more and more about it, I said, this is the group to talk to about the youth assessments. And I think really the follow-up is to give an invitation to, to Trish, uh, Director Cortez, uh, and maybe uh, Catherine O'Grady. And then they can speak to, I don't know what the leadership architecture for, for that is. Uh, right now, I know Commissioner Labar has sent out um, to some of the stakeholders an email uh, that's sort of like an assessment, I mean, a survey. What's important? What should we be thinking about as we think about this? So, so as the county is thinking about investing in this, your voice to those commissioners to to invest in this will be critically important. So, uh, again, I would suggest bringing in folks that know more about it than I. You know, obviously, you guys getting more educated about it, and then talking to the board of commissioners and encouraging them to support this and make sure that we have structural investment. Uh, for this moving forward. I think it's, it is, I think, one of the foundational components for how we move forward as a county. Great. Thank you. Jane, I'm going to turn it over to you to wrap us up. Okay. Well, I'm thrilled to know about the Youth Assessment Center. I certainly did not know we had this in place in the county. I will reach out to those people because they will be key to us moving in a new direction. I thank you, Sheriff Clayton. You have been fabulous. It's just a joy to be in your presence. And I know you have a busy day starting right now as soon as we end this call, but um, my big gratitude goes to you and to Kathy Wyatt for your contribution this morning. It's been fabulous. I've learned so much. It has been interesting and I can't wait to move forward and continue. Thank you so much.
Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Keep up the great work. This is how we build right strong communities. Thank you so much.